Good, good morning, everybody. Um, hello, and welcome to my talk. My name is Jason Spencer. Um, my talk is called An IoT War Story. Uh, just quickly, a little bit about me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Breaker of Signs. I'm a security analyst at Orange Cyber Defense, where I've been for the last three years. Um, what I enjoy doing in my personal time is surfing, golfing, and uh, hacking on the weekends. Um, so this talk will go through kind of the emotions of an assessment, from scope fails to the learning I required to do an assessment, how clients put things together, um, I'll then focus on two different hacks I did, and then um, driving a struggle bus up Sani Pass trying to find a solution. Um, the original title for this talk, and maybe what I should have kept it at, was AMQPS, AWS, API, IoT Assessment, or Acronym Soup and How to Deal with It. Um, I was on an assessment about a year ago, and I read through the scope of work, and I said, something, something's off. It was an API assessment, but it kept referencing some cloud component, and I was like, maybe like an API in the cloud, I don't know. So I go to my friend Simon, who worked on the scope, and I said, hey dude, what's what's up with this? Something, something just seems off. Um, so he says, no, no, it's all good. It, the cloud component, just ignore that. This is a Swagger assessment, very basic. You know, go ask for the Swagger files in the kickoff meeting, and you'll be fine. So, you know, Feeling like this is a pretty standard assessment, I decide, super confident, I'm going to walk into this meeting with my notes, everything I need, I'm, you know, I'm confident, I can tell this client what I need. Um, so, big smiles, in a meeting with a lot of people, and I say, hey guys, can you give me the Swagger files? And genuinely, this client started laughing at me. Um, so, I'm starting to feel a little less confident in this meeting. But I'm still, I still know what I'm doing. So I say, so then he just starts spouting acronyms at me, just throwing words all over the room, like we're all just supposed to know what he's talking about. AWS, a AMQP, IoT. And I was like, what? Um, and then he had the audacity to stop, look at me, and say, what do you know about AMQP? And let me tell you, honestly, I had never heard this term in my life. Um, I kind of felt like a deer in the headlight. The first thought I could possibly have is, well, fuck you, Simon. You've, <laughs> you've got me in trouble. Um, didn't really know what to do. Just sweating beans, um, thinking, you know, like, well, well, fuck. Um, Fortunately, one of the first things I learned when I joined SensePost was the best hackers are the ones who know how to Google well. So whilst he was throwing acronyms around the room, I thought to myself, the best thing I can do right now is to Google the thing I know the least about. You know, right now, I didn't even know if AMQP was an acronym. Um, so fortunately, I had done that. I Googled. And one of the first things that... Um, came up on the Google search history, uh, Google search was differences between AMQP and MQTT. And I figured, you know, if there's differences, there's got to be similarities. So I said to the client, well, I don't know much about it, but I know MQTT and I know they're basically the same thing. And it must have been true because he bought it. Um, so it kind of did feel like a bit of a superhero moment. I jumped over the car, um, you know, feeling pretty proud of myself, I could go on and do this assessment. You know, sweat off the brow moment. First thing I had to do was tell Simon that he was wrong. He didn't know what he was doing. He shouldn't be my, my boss and uh, he sucks. But then after that, I needed to figure out what to do. So now we're gonna talk a bit more about the boring stuff, the learning that you needed to do in order to perform this assessment, and then some hacks that we did. Um, before I jump into the learnings, <coughs> We, I needed to have a look and understand, you know, what is this, what is this architecture? What are we actually testing um, before we get, get into the nitty gritty of what is AMQB? So this is the client's architecture. So a device or an IoT device is speaking to a manager that it manages that IoT device with MQTT. That manager speaks to a message queue with AMQP. A consumer reads off that message queue with AMQP and pushes data onto a global data lake, and then from 
um, behind on my numbers. And then from there, a customer portal uses an API query to query that data lake for data relevant to them. So as I said in my original bit, this is an AMQP AWS API IoT assessment. So um, the A AWS is this RabbitMQ endpoint lives. Uh, the, that's the cloud component. The RabbitMQ endpoint is an A AWS API gateway. So we're testing not from the IoT device to the manager. We're, we're not testing from the consumer to the data lake or from the customer portal to the data lake. It's simply from the manager to the RabbitMQ um, API gateway. Um, so I had to say, say that I assumed the breach of that manager so that I had credentials in order to interact with that, um, that service. But just for interest sake, let's have a look at this section here. All right. So one of my very smart colleagues, George, and later Rogan and William repeated it, had to test this attack vector here. So unfortunately, in a rather trivial start to the assessment um, for the client, um, George was able to uh, boot the machine in recovery mode, add his own root user, and as the Brits might say, Bob's your uncle, he had everything. Um, so George did a bit of dumpster diving, and one of the first things he found was configuration files, lots of fun things in there, but most importantly for me, the RabbitMQ credentials. Um, an important fact about this manager is it is delivered to the various customers, so it lives on site at the at different customers and isn't managed or controlled by the specific client we're testing, which means it opens them up to local physical attacks, which George's attack is then plausible, which makes my attack plausible because I was able to get the credentials. Um, so we're going to assume we're going to go from the manager from here on out, so we can just erase this and just assume we have control of the manager and we're trying to push data to the customer portal. Um, so now, as I said before, we're going to discuss some basic stuff, um, learnings, just to understand what IoT is, you know, for those who may not know. It's just things connected to things. It's quite simple. It's sensors or internet connected sensors that um, gather data about itself or its environment and push that data to a hub or a gateway. That hub or gateway will either analyze the data there or it will push it further to get analyzed somewhere else. In our case, of course, we're pushing data to a gateway, which is then pushing data onto the cloud in order to get analyzed, and then we'll push that data back to the IoT device. So one example of using IoT in our lives is cars that are using uh, Google Maps or Waze in order to generate the fastest route. So they have the ability to look at other cars, see where there is traffic, and push you down a direction that will make it faster for you. Another example is wearing a smartwatch. Now, in my instance, my smartwatch is gathering data about its environment, me, my heart rate, my VO2 levels, my sleep patterns, it's pushing that data via Bluetooth to my gateway, my cell phone, um, which is then being analyzed and pushing that data back to my watch. So we use IoT in our lives um, to live, uh, to have a smarter, easier life. You know, we want uh, everything to be kind of maintained or be in a state of homeostasis. So for, for businesses, we want IoT to help our customer experience, to save us money, to save us time, um, in order for us to further, uh, sorry, in order for us to make the lives of our customers easier. Because everyone else is doing it, if your job, if your um, business isn't making the life of the customer easier, they'll go somewhere that's faster for them to get out of the shop. On the flip side, however, it adds risk. So increasing our attack surface every time we add something to the internet, right? Our digital footprint expands. So a smart lock, which might add security because you can check remotely if I, my door is locked, you know, if I can log in on my phone and have a little bit of extra usability because I unlock my door before I get home or before I get to the door. However, should that be hacked, of course, that opens up further risk for us, right? If that can be opened by anyone. So most people who have IoT in their lives probably have a little Raspberry Pi um, hosting some sort of home assistant, um, and they use it to just manage their home environment, their life, right? You know, are my alarms set? Are my windows closed? What's my aircon doing? Recently, I was talking to my boss about this, and he was showing me his home assistant implementation and said how, and said how when he's on his way home, 
he logs onto the platform, checks the uh, temperature of his rooms and retro and um, corrects that so that when he gets home, he can um, be in a comfortable environment. Now, what if I could modify the temperature he is seeing? Um, <coughs> you know, if, if I could modify the temperature he is seeing, he might do the adverse of his intention. He might make the, the room hotter than it already was. Um, now, this wouldn't do anything serious other than really annoy my boss. Um, but what if instead of it was his room, it was a fridge or a set of fridges in a, in a warehouse and we could ruin the produce? Well, that's, that's the crux of our attack. You know, I'm not attacking the IoT device itself. I'm not attacking um, the, the data lake or the customer portal. I'm trying to modify the data that's seen at that customer portal in order for the data that's being sent back to, um, to negatively affect the IoT devices on the way back. Now, if we were at, uh, scoped in order to test the IoT device itself, sure, I could try and send um, illegitimate commands in order to make the temperature hotter itself on the device. However, I can, if I can push data to the customer portal and get the, the a legitimate command from the customer portal to affect the room, the device, the IoT device, will have no way of verifying that it's incorrect and will just act accordingly. So it might seem more legitimate to come back that way. <clears throat> so naturally, the first thing that we might ask when you hear AMQPS, AWS API, IoT assessment is what in the hell is AMQP? So an advanced message queuing protocol system is quite simple. It's actually just, a, it's like a simple queue. It's MQTT or anything else. It's just a data comes in and it get, puts on a queue and it comes out the other end. Um, AMQP is an application layer protocol, but it's also, um, it defines the network layer and the high level architecture of the broker. So when, I, when you see RabbitMQ, that's just this specific implementation. There is other brokers that can utilize AMQP, but AMQP defines how that broker must work. Now you can also, <coughs> you can also implement certain of your own rules, but there are defaults that need to be implemented in order for AMQP to function. Um, so to start this, let's try and understand what exactly a queue is. All right, so queues are extremely simple in their design. Generally, they're comprised of three parts, a producer, the message queue itself, and a consumer. Message queues work um, in an asynchronous communication method, uh, meaning that a producer does not need to wait for a consumer to absorb um, or deal with that data that's being um, sent in order for the producer to keep working. <coughs> Sorry, a nice example of that is when I send an email to Leon, Leon is way too busy and too cool to talk to me, so he never replies. Um, so I can keep doing my job. I don't need to wait for him. Otherwise, I would never get work done. Um, queues work synonymously in real life as they do in message queues. And that's in a first in, first out manner, which is first in the queue, first out of the queue. Um, the clients are the producers and the consumers, whereas the server is the middleware. So that's the broker that we were speaking about. Um, when I originally gave this talk to Leon, uh, he's unfortunately for him had to sit through it many times. Um, I showed him how AMQP works and even him who is much smarter than me said, dude, that was so complicated. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so we're going to be using the analogy of me going to buy an apple at Woolworths in order to understand how this works. Now, Woolworths I'm just using because their queues work synonymously with RabbitMQ. Um, whereas if I went to pick and pay, we separate into different tills. This is just one large queue. Um, so if I was to go shopping at Woolworths for an apple, um, I join the queue with my apple, I stand behind this lady, and when I get to the front, I can buy. I, in this case, am the producer, the apple is my message, and um, the man at the checkout counter is the consumer. In this case, after he's passed on the message, he happens to pass that apple back to me, but what the consumer does to deal with that message is not my business. I just need to give it to him. <coughs> So this is me getting to the front. So <coughs> if I, oh, sorry. So again, we're at Woolworths. There is not just one queue. There's many queues. So now I'm going to go through the concept of how consumers work. So multiple consumers can come to work every day. So at Woolworths, there's many consumers. I am 
in dark here, the fourth person with my apple, I will, the first lady will go to the first person, the second man goes to the second um, till, the lady there, the third person goes to the third till, and so on, uh, sorry, the, f the first till again, if two consumers came to work that day. Um, so an important facet of how RabbitMQ and Woolworths work is once I go to till one, I don't go and show my food to till number two. That is only um, visible to the first till person. So if I am chosen by the first till person, that is who will see my data. And that is the same as with RabbitMQ. If I am the first person in the queue, I'll go to the first person who subscribed to that queue. That's the first consumer. Now, the next question we might ask is who can consume? Now, at Woolworths, same as at, um, <coughs> the same as in RabbitMQ, we have the ability to define exactly who can do it. So, obviously, somebody from pick and pay can't go and stand behind a counter in Woolworths and say, hey, I want to serve you. So, you need to be authenticated to serve somebody. You need to have credentials in order to subscribe. Um, but the next thing is, okay, cool, but can any Woolworths employee go from anywhere in the world? Well, Woolworths can say anybody with a badge can go and stand behind a counter and help people. Woolworths also has the ability to say, hey, only people from this very specific branch can go. So in RabbitMQ terms, if I have a very specific IP address, then I'm able to consume off this network. But what happens, <coughs> but Woolworths also can say, okay, cool, but I don't just want anybody in this branch to go. I want people in this branch who have a who have been hired as a counter worker. So again, in RabbitMQ terms, that would be somebody who can subscribe to a very specific virtual host, which I'll speak about uh, in a bit more detail now. Um, so somebody from a very specific branch, so an IP address on a specific queue in a specific virtual host. So RabbitMQ has the ability to say, only certain people can consume, or they can say anybody who's got credentials. <coughs> so again, we're at Woolworths, and now we're in the food section, um, but there's actually two queues, I lied to you earlier. There's one queue that everyone can go to, and there's a second queue where only people who have 10 items or less can go. Now, the second queue is what would be referred to as a routing algorithm, right? So do I have 10 items or less or not, i.e., Am I just have here with my Apple? And if I am, then I'll join the root, the queue. So in RabbitMQ terms, that would be an exchange of type <coughs> direct or the default case for how it works, right? So the default way is if I match the routing algorithm, I'm allowed to join that queue. Um, an exchange is what we use to bind um, messages onto queues. So it, it routes, it's a routing algorithm to bind messages onto queues. So do I match it or not? And the default way built by the RabbitMQ's <laughs> framework is a direct queue. Now, this routing algorithm, we either have 10 or we don't have 10 items. So if I do have 10, I join the queue. If I don't, I'm not allowed to. Now, naturally, if I were to have more than 10 items, they're gonna say, get away from here. You've got two bags full of items and this line is only for, only for people with less. But what if you go shopping at Woolworths on a Saturday? Now, let's be honest, it's a, it's a, it's a shit show on a, at lunchtime on a Saturday. Everyone's there buying their lunch, their weekly groceries, and you know, it's a mess. So there's very few people who are actually there buying 10 items or less. So if, <coughs> sorry. Um, so if this was the case, a Woolworths employee might say to you, hey, come with me, let's join the shorter queue even though you have more than 10 items. Now, in RabbitMQ terms, if I was on an exchange of type fan out, that would mean that it doesn't actually matter if I, if I have the right routing algorithm. I can just send my data there. All I need to know is where the exchange lives, i.e. I've entered Woolworths, that means I can go on any queue now. It will just push me onto a queue because you are in the shop of Woolworths. Now, speaking of different queues, I'm now gonna go through the concept of virtual hosts. All right, so if we have a look at this diagram, in Woolworths, there's more than one different section, right? So we've got a home section here donated by um, the apothecary section. We have a clothing section, which is donated by the, um, the sporting goods section. And we have a food section, which I'm not really sure what that is. Um, those are the only images I could find. 
Uh, so we have three different virtual hosts, right? So I can go and shop in Woolworths. Uh, anybody who walks into Woolworths is immediately authenticated, right? So let's just assume that you have credentials to speak to RabbitMQ um, endpoint. <coughs> so the next thing is, if I was to go shopping in the food section, well, now I would be expected to pay for my goods in the fooding section because that is where I am now authorized to purchase goods, right? So I have been authenticated by walking in the shop, but I'm, I'm only authorized to pay for my goods in the section that I currently am. Um, but Woolworths, again, has the ability to have a lax ruling of this. You know, sometimes I've been at Woolworths, I've filled up a trolley, I've looked at the queue and I've said, well, the homing section is dead empty, I'm gonna go there and be mean. Um, so if I took my clothes to the clothing section and pay for my goods there, I have been authorized to, to shop in a different virtual host. What this means is, in RabbitMQ terms, I can say, only people who shop in food section have to pay in food section. Or I can say, look, as long as you're authenticated, go and do whatever the hell you want. I don't really care. <coughs> so a virtual host is kind of exactly what you would imagine it to be. It's a namespace with its own exchanges, with its own queues, with its own bindings and everything else. Um, but how we authenticate to that is secondary to authenticating to the RabbitMQ node itself. So we first authenticate by walking into Woolworths and then we authorize ourselves by going to the queue we're allowed to go to. So essentially this, right? This is a message broker, right? So we've got a producer that can send into a virtual host. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, into an, uh, a producer that can send a message into an API, uh, a broker API endpoint. The broker has one or more virtual hosts, and each in each virtual host you have one or more exchanges, which have um, a binding to one or more queues, and that queue can be consumed by a subscribed consumer, or oh, one or more subscribed consumers. So before we go on to the hacks and stuff, let's have a look at the client architecture again. Let's try and understand exactly what is going on. So as you can see here, we have each manager belongs to a, se a separate company. So a manager belongs to a company. It has one or more IoT devices. Those IoT devices send their device information with a device ID to a message queue broker. Um, the consumer consumes off that, sends that data into a global data lake, and then each customer portal will uh, send an API query to the global data lake and ask specifically for the data on um, within their company. So some important things to recognize here is obviously they each have sequential device IDs. This is not just within the organization. <coughs> this is cross-organization. So device ID one belongs to the first company. If I was the second company and loaded my IoT device next, I'm device ID two. Um, when we hit the RabbitMQ endpoint, we have an exchange of type fanout. Now, what you'll remember about that is it doesn't matter if I know the routing algorithm, which is obviously going to get important. So this is an example that I set up um, with a AMQP fanout type on the exchange with a routing algorithm of us.hash. That's us. Um, wildcard, so it can be anything. I just needed to know the US dot. Or in this case, because it's fan art, I didn't need to know anything. As you'll notice down here, the routing algorithm I actually sent it in with is DN. I don't know if anyone can see that, it's quite small. Um, but I sent in DN and I was still able to push that traffic onto the queue. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that is obviously then sent with MQTT onto a data lake. And then from there, the API query works onto the Cool, so why are we here? All right, so we've had to endure a pretty stressful kickoff meeting. Um, next, we had to take a step back, learn, figure out you know, what exactly is going on. Everyone's a little bit confused, um, but I'm sure you're all thinking, give me what I came here for, this is cybersecurity, and I wanna see some hacking. So next, I'm gonna go through two different attacks um, that we did, an evil producer and an evil consumer, and then I'll go through how we struggled to find a solution. 
So, the evil producer. Now, we're all sending into the same queue. It's all going to the same data lake, and everyone's just querying for it. So, I'm sure all of you who were sitting there were thinking, Jason, this is obvious. You're just going to send in to, your, uh, to the other device ID from your um, manager, from your company that you own. You're going to use those credentials sent into the manager, and then this client data's integrity is going to be ruined because they're now pulling all of my data. Now, obviously, I can produce tons and tons and tons of data, so I will overshadow any of the data that's being sent by the actual device um, in this case. Uh, when I did this, uh, I, like I said, Leon's unfortunately for him had to sit through this many times. On about the fourth or fifth time, he looked at me and he said, Jason, how, how did you do that? Like, how did you send traffic in? I said, what do you mean? Like, I, I, I wrote like a, a tiny little Python script and Leon was quite angry with me. He said, how have you waited this long to tell me that you actually wrote something for this? Now, I, I did wait that long, but that was just because, as you can see, it's, not, it's nothing impressive. But Leon said, well, you've got to put it on Git for people to look at. So it's on Git now. Um, and because it's on Git, I had to delete all of my other crappy repositories so nobody could see that. Um, didn't need anybody looking at like CUDA programming. It was dog show up there. Um, anyways, yeah, so there are a couple things that you needed in order to interact with this endpoint. So obviously, I needed to create a connection with to a channel. Like I need to create a channel connection. So I needed to know where the host lived. I could get that from the configuration file. And then it was understanding what virtual hosts there were, you know, what other data I needed in order to connect to it. Now this was AMQPS, so it was slightly trickier, although all I needed to do was add context and say I didn't really care about any certificate you have. So I didn't verify anything, just sent in the context, uh, the data there. <laughs> the information that I needed was the virtual host. That was the tricky one to, to find. But because the client was very nice, they gave super verbose credentials and I was able to actually interact with the management node. So I could <coughs> I could use a RabNMQ CTL tool that they've created in order to act, interact with the RabbitMQ node. And from there, I could pull what queues were in use, what exchanges were in use. So I was able to get like the general information that I needed from from um, interacting with the RabbitMQ CTL tool. I then used a Pika library, which is a Python library used um, in order to create and manage AMQP. So you can publish data, you can consume data, and you can actually start a server um, there. So I created a connection, and then it's a very simple tool. Um, a command where you just need to publish the data knowing a routing key. Again, didn't need to know that, so I just wrote anything there to the fanart um, exchange, and then it was pushed on. And then, of course, um, the important thing being the body, um, where I'm sending that this t um, refrigerator's running at 69 degrees. So hopefully they'll hopefully they'll fix that. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I didn't realize that. So. <laughs> um, okay, so the next attack that uh, we looked at was, well, as I spoke about with Ed Woolworths, you know, who, how restrictive are you being when you say you can consume, right? Now, in my case, um, not was the answer. So I could create my own evil consumer, um, which would read traffic off of the, the queue. Now, as, as you'll remember, the first consumer is going to read the first message. Because they've created the queue, we can assume that they have a subscribed consumer to the queue. So I'm the second consumer. So the first message comes in from a company, and I can read the second message off. Now, that's obviously important for a couple different facets. The first being customer two never actually receives their data. Um, so they've like lost their availability. And the second being that I have read sensitive information. Um, <coughs> yeah, so one important thing here is obviously they've now created a single consumer, but I can create hundreds of consumers. So if I have a hundred consumers, they will read the first message and I will read message two through 101 and then they will read message 102. Um, because I have the ability to create as many as I want, I can pretty much make what they legitimately see invalid or you know useless because it'll only receive that every hundredth message, 101st message. So again, the how, 
Um, again, very simple. Uh, you just create a connection string, and then I needed to create a loop um, in order to continuously consume, so it didn't just kill off the, after the first um, read. And then it's just a basic um, uh, thing to consume. So I needed to identify, in this case, where the queue was, not necessarily the exchange. So I used RabbitMQ to view where connections were coming from, so I could read where their consumer lived and what channel it was connecting to. So I could attach to that same channel and read data off of it. Um, now, so those are the attacks, and now I want to have a look at um, potential solutions and what, uh, what struggles we went through to why that wouldn't work. So the first thing we thought was, well, you don't, you don't have a, a virtual host. Well, let's, let's separate each client, each company into their own host. Um, the data will go to different places. Um, you know, I can't send to your virtual host and then, you know, it'll go up. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, I'll tell you, so here's a, a little story. When a while back I took my friend out to a fancy restaurant and um, they, they only served one, like you weren't allowed to pick your meal. You have to eat what they were eating. And it was like, it was squid ink with like some puffed popcorn. I don't really understand it. And I can only imagine, I can only imagine that two chefs came in that day and one was like, I am making squid ink goo. And the other chef was like, I'm making popcorn. So they were like, well, we're serving squid ink and popcorn. Um, in, when you have many cooks, you know, everyone's got their own opinion. And everybody says, this is the way I'm doing something. So. The person in this case who created the squid ink part said, this is not going to work. Uh, a virtual host will not work because I'm using MQTT and MQTT has no virtual host. This is something we learned in the Google search differences between MQTT and RabbitMQ. So they said, there's no way that we can work with this because your virtual host won't work. So I, I tried to show them all RabbitMQ uses at least the root virtual host. So you are, you just don't want to separate it more. And they said, no, 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 we know what we're talking about. And I've only done this for a week at this point. So I'm like, all right, well, you know what you're talking about. So, um, but technically this wouldn't have worked anyway. And the reason for that is it actually doesn't matter if I send, if I can't send into their virtual host because we're all going into the same data lake. So if I send my traffic with the incorrect uh, device ID to my virtual host, this gets consumed by the global consumer and pushed to the global data lake, um, then customer one is still going to read off all of my information. So it doesn't actually matter. Um, so the second thing we thought of was, well, let's not, let's not say that the attack is impossible, but let's like reduce the likelihood significantly. So we'll, we'll move it away from device IDs and we'll put really hard to guess GUIDs. Now, the person who was in charge of the popcorn said to me, well, we've already agreed to device IDs and I am not going to touch GUIDs. That's, that's too much extra work. Sign up SLA. No, that's not going not gonna, to not gonna fly with us. So I said, all right, cool. Um, but technically, this wouldn't have worked anyway. Um, and the reason for that is because we have the Easeville consumer. So I have created a consumer. I can read off of the queue. Um, which means I can steal the sensitive information regarding that GUID. And then of course, once I have, see, once I have um, the GUID or I have that sensitive information, I can then send traffic into the queue and the customer portal is gonna read my message. So it didn't actually matter. So, so what do we actually do? Like, how do we, how do we solve this? So personally, my first thought, um, and I kind of still feel like is the problem is we have this global data link, right? We're just dumping everything into the same place and we're using the customer portal to like query it. Um, but we don't really, the customer portal has no way of verifying what data is valid and what data is invalid in the customer portal. Their sole job is, hey, is this, give, give me everything for my device ID. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not a solution. We can't just say that's the problem. So what do we do? We need a, we need to actually try and help our client, right? So we can't just say, we'll put virtual hosts in because they can't do that. We can't just say, we'll do GUIDs because you know they can't do that. So we need to come up with a solution where they can actually actively do something to fix it. So the final thing we thought of was, all right, well, let's set the data that goes into the manager. We'll sign that data at the manager level 
um, the consumer can decode that message and then read what's inside. So if manager has sent something with device ID one and they are, uh, sorry, device ID two, manager two, um, then it will go into the data link. If, however, they send something for device ID three, they need to log that, drop it and report and say, hey, why are you sending traffic in for the wrong device ID? Um, so only valid messages should actually ever get to the data link. The next thing we obviously recommended, uh, well, not obviously, is, you know, you shouldn't let everyone consume. So they said, no, well, we need to consume in order to send um, traffic back from the customer portal to the IoT device. We need to be able to talk backwards. So the best way we could say, do that is you can only consume off of a very specific virtual host. So in this case, you should have a virtual host, at least one going forward and one going backwards, and you only let people consume off of the one going backwards so that this attack path isn't possible. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, you know, at the beginning of this talk, I said, well, honestly, fuck Simon. And that is the way I felt in the beginning, but had Simon read the scope properly, he said he never would have actually put me on this assessment. So I wouldn't have had the fun, the learning opportunities that I did. So instead of um, freaking out, running around like a headless chicken and swearing at Simon a lot, you know, take a step back, you will figure it out and it's a lot more enjoyable than doing a normal web app or mobile. Um, yeah, so we have IoT in our lives um, to make ourselves easier, you know, make our environments um, more, more maintainable, smarter, um, but when you put things in correct, together incorrectly, it can be a bit of a mess. And lastly, you know, third parties can distribute the workload, um, but when you have too many uh, cooks in the kitchen, you're bound to end up with some weird squid ink goo and popcorn. Um, yeah. Uh, lastly, I just want to say some thanks to some of my colleagues who helped me both on the assessment, um, Simon for messing up the scope, Leon for helping me with this talk, um, Orange, and then B-Sides and you guys for sitting throughout the thing. Um, I, I really hope you did enjoy some of it or all of it. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, shoot them here or message me on Twitter. I am the breaker of science. Essentially, if we are, you know, seeing data that's out of sync, should we not delete that at the customer portal level, at the at the endpoint, or uh, you're on the way to the customer portal? If we see 69 and a fridge should only be running at 25, um, then we should throw out that data that is invalid data. Yeah, you look at data trends. If something's way off, you know, deal with it that way. I think that's a really valid approach. Um, in this case, obviously, I'm trying. Uh, um, to uh, to flood it with invalid data. So I'm hopeful that if you were to implement something like that, as an attacker, I would hope that I am flooding it with so much data that it becomes the trend maybe. 
Um, but I do think that that's a very valid approach and something that you should analyze. Something that you should analyze um, is that data at at various points, like at the consumer level. If we are seeing something invalid, that's why you know we look at that signed data. Is it correct? Is it not? Is it coming from the right place? Like you say, the IoT device itself could be malfunctioning or sending from that level. Um, a colleague of mine suggested it wouldn't have worked in this solution. Too many cooks, um, but a colleague of mine suggested you know signing the data at the IoT level. So that we aren't ever getting to a point where the data could be manipulated and sent in. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a very valid way of approaching it. I just think that there's security in depth means you need to also account for the fact that if somebody floods it with data, that needs to happen. Or, you know, at the consumer level, can I consume and steal your data? And then you're not seeing valid data anyway. Thank <laughs> you.